Good morning. Hey, I'm so excited. I'm honored to be here preaching. Robert asked me to preach on the topic of community as we wrap up our community month. So we're taking a short pause from our hashtag blessed series, which he will wrap up this coming week. But this morning, I want to dive right into our text. So if you have a Bible, paper, digital form, let's get it out and open up with me, if you would, to Acts 2. Acts 2, 44 through 47. We're going to be reading about the very first church community. <clears throat> the verse is going to be up on the screen, so you can read along with me there as well. It says this, All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray and we'll get going. Hey, Lord, I'm so thankful that, Lord, your text reveals your character and your nature. It reveals your heart for your people, Lord. And we thank you for this glimpse into that first church community, Lord, and what community might look like. God, I pray that as we read your word and study your word this morning, Lord, that you would do something in our hearts so that we might be able to love others the way that you, Jesus, love your church. Pray it in your name. Amen. All right, so this past month, we've been on break from life groups to be doing these community events. We've had all sorts of events, movie nights and bonfires and hiking excursions. We had a family's equipping night, bowling night. By show of hands, who was able to attend one of these events over the past month? Woo -woo. Great. I was down at the Coronado Beaches uh, for the bonfire with my family, and as I'm walking with my girls back to the van, the first words out of my mouth were, man, that was fun. I mean, I look over at Evelyn and Emma, and they have s'mores still on their face and glow sticks around their wrists and sand all over their bodies, which got into our van, which then got into our house, which is one of the joys of living in Southern California. And my daughter said to me, she said, hey, can we do this again tomorrow night? And I said... I'll call the church and ask if they want to do this again tomorrow night. So we had a great time, and I hope that you too were able to meet new friends, go deeper into friendship, and that you feel more connected to a sense of community. But this morning, I want to share with you two communities, uh, stories of two communities from my past that have deeply impacted me. The first was from my college days as a single when I was a campus, uh, a student on campus with a campus ministry. And the second was as a married couple in Wheaton, Illinois, which is our spiritual community there. So when I was 18 years old, I moved out of state for college. I moved from Minnesota to Montana, and I was in search of adventures. I wanted to ski and get a degree while I was at it. It's probably a good idea. And so I was expecting adventure, but what I did not expect was the unraveling that would take place that first year when my parents let us know that they would be divorcing after 25 years of marriage. Suddenly, the home life that I had known all of my life since the time I was born was coming undone. You know, suddenly there was two homes and eventually two sets of parents and an additional set of grandparents. And I started questioning a lot of things about faith and family and I'd been raised in the church. And I was like, is this all a lie? And I was hurting. I was lonely. I was confused. And so I started seeking out community. I joined a fraternity and I uh, joined a couple campus ministries and uh, I started being careless with my life. I started taking risks that I shouldn't have and skiing and outdoor pursuits. And, but one day I was on our lawn of our dorm and I came into contact with a group of students um, who were playing ultimate frisbee. And the campus pastor uh, walks up to me and from this, this group, and he says, hey, um, you want to play with us? And so I play some ultimate frisbee, and afterwards he said, hey, do you want to give me a ride home? And I said, sure, I'll give you a ride home. I don't know who you are, but <laughs> I'm in college. <laughs> what does it matter? <laughs> so I give him a ride home, and, and he ends up becoming my mentor. Uh, I start going to our campus meetings up on campus. I join a life group. Uh, I start getting mentored, but I also start making deep friendships with these people. And over the course of those four years, I started growing into a man of God. You know, in a season of life where I could have so easily run from God, they were challenging me to press into God and into community. 
I honestly, I'm surprised that I'm here today when I think about it. Had it not been for God, had it not been for that spiritual community, I would not be here today. So fast forward seven years later, Katie and I were then engaged to be married, and my wife gets a job offer uh, at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. So once again, uh, we pick up our things and we move, and I find myself in a brand new place, not knowing anybody, but my wife and I resolved to find a local church, so we did a very holy thing. We Googled, and we said, Lord, where should we go to church? How many of you have Googled before for a church? Yeah, okay, I'm not the only one. And we come into a church on that first Sunday called Antioch Community Church, and this church would forever change my life. I mean, the way that they did relationships was so incredible. I remember countless times we'd be sitting around a table or around a bonfire, and we'd be sharing stories, crazy stories from our past when we were in college, picking up strangers. And, and then we would tell each other about our hopes and our dreams. We'd dream together. We'd travel together. We'd pray for one another, worship together. We shared life with one another. But perhaps the most powerful story from that time, I remember clearly, uh, came one particular evening when Katie and I just happened to be in a conflict. I don't know if you married people ever experienced that in your first few years of marriage. And a uh, little conflict, a little offense. And we were struggling, to be honest, uh, through that first two years of marriage to figure out what it is to be one, what it is to be married. And, but we'd been invited over to dinner. So we put on a smile, and you know what that's like. It's real fun to go into a social engagement when you're not on the same page with your spouse. And we show up with smiles on our face, and we had brought Chipotle over, and so there over our Chipotle burritos, we start sharing about uh, our lives, and they start asking us questions that start probing our hearts, and we start opening up to them, and we started sharing about the conflict that we were in, and we actually got into conflict about the conflict that we were in right there, right there in front of our friends, and tears were shed, and we were vulnerable, and it was an exposed feeling, you know, to be wide open in front of other people. But do you know how they responded? They listened. They loved us. They encouraged us. And they believed in us even when we didn't necessarily believe in ourselves. If it wasn't for that community, I know that we would not have the great marriage that we have today. Our community in Wheaton was a place where we were strengthened when we felt weak. Both Katie and I, individually and as a couple, were strengthened. This, for us, was Christ-centered community. Yet, not all of our community experiences are all that pleasant. <laughs> Over the course of my life, I've experienced rejection from community. I have been disappointed by community. I have felt betrayed and unseen, overlooked. I have felt pain from community, and I have inflicted pain on others in community, I am sure. Katie and I have left communities, we've been left by community, we've started communities, and we've been welcomed into existing communities. All of us in this room have history with community, don't we? Some deeply painful and some profoundly beautiful. Community can be messy, disappointing, and downright difficult. So why is it that we keep choosing to press into community? Why is community so vital? I mean, after all, Sometimes it just seems a lot easier to do life on our own. Don't have to argue with anybody. You do what you want to do. Go where you want to go. I mean, could not a person survive without community? So in preparation for this message, I was doing some research on the topics of community, relationships, and people who live in isolation, and I found some staggering statistics. Did you know that experts are now coining the term Loneliness epidemic. They're saying that there is a loneliness epidemic in the United States. I mean, this isn't just like, oh, some people feel lonely once in a while. This is like on the same level of polio and malaria. This one study conducted by Cigna Health Corporation drawing from more than 20,000 U.S. adults across the country revealed some alarming findings. One out of four Americans do not feel as though there are people who really understand them. Four out of ten Americans feel that their relationships are not meaningful and that they are isolated from others. One out of five people report that they do not feel close to people or feel like there are people they can talk to. Only 53% of Americans have meaningful, 
in-person social interactions, such as having an extended conversation with a friend or spending quality time with family on a daily basis. And Generation Z, adults ages 18 through 22, is reportedly the most lonely generation and claims to be in worse health than older generations. That was surprising. Here's what some experts are saying. Dr. Douglas Nemesik, chief medical officer for behavioral health at Cigna says this, loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, making it even more dangerous than obesity. Former Surgeon General Dr. Vivek H. Murthy says this, loneliness is a growing health epidemic. We live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. I mean, is it no wonder that God said it is not good for man to be alone? Loneliness is not good. It's so not good that I would call it a downright evil. And we know it's evil because it's the antithesis of who God is in his very nature. In the Bible, we read about three persons in one, which makes up the? Our God is three persons in one. Genesis 1-2 says this, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This was before any of us existed. Skip ahead to John 1, and we read about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was with God in the beginning. You see, God was never alone. God was never lonely. He didn't create us out of this neediness, but rather he created us out of the overflow of what was already in his heart, community. Church, we were made from community for community. We were made from community for community. But unfortunately, one of the first consequences of sin is the feeling that we need to hide and that feeling that we need to isolate ourselves from God and from other people. You know, the Bible has over 1,200, about 1,200 chapters in it, and only three chapters into the Bible we read about Adam and Eve and the initial sin and what they do. Genesis 3, 8 through 9 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? You guys, sin causes us to want to hide from community. Sin causes us to feel embarrassed. We feel ashamed. We feel scared. And when others sin against us, we feel rejected and offended. We feel insecure. And so we get prideful thinking, hey, I'm above community. I don't need people. I can do this on my own. And all of these feelings stem back to sin. Recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was home and I was backing my Jeep into the driveway and my doors were off, my mirrors were off, which I love to do on a nice hot day. And I was backing my Jeep into our driveway and just for a moment, I forgot that my wife's van was parked directly behind me. Yeah, go ahead and laugh, it's all right. I placed a big old dent in her crisp, clear white bumper. I was so frustrated. I was embarrassed. And we had company over, so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to give it some time and, <laughs> you know, wait, wait this out and bring it up in a, in a, you know, when the timing is right. So two days go by, and, <coughs> and I'm sitting eating burgers with Christian Jimenez and a few other people, and I get a picture message from my wife of, of the bumper and she calls me following immediately, and she says, Honey, I'm in the Target parking lot, and I think somebody hit my van. <laughs> oh, honey, I'm so sorry. That's horrible. <laughs> what kind of jerk would hit your car and not say anything? <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, I am so sorry. It was me. Yes, I fessed up, but my default was to hide. I didn't tell her right away. I hid it because I was embarrassed. I was scared of what she would think, and she would lose respect and be scared. And Hiding is not how we were created to live, but so many of us do it anyway. Rather than running to community, we run from community. We see, church, 
if we don't deal with these feelings that keep us hiding, we're going to continue living lives, isolated lives. We're going to remain stuck in our greatest places of need, stuck in our sin and our shame, stuck in our loneliness. And ultimately, we are all going to miss out on the incredible relationships that God has for us. So what's the answer? Well, professionals have a slew of solutions for us. They say this, spend time, more time with people. They say spend less time on social media. They say get plenty of sleep. They say spend more time with family. And they say join social organizations. And the list goes on and on and on. And most of these ideas seem like good ideas, except they forget one crucial element. It's not that easy. I mean, don't you think people want friends? Don't you think people want a tight-knit community and close relationships with their family? But it's not that easy. So we, we still hide. You see, people get stuck in these feelings of fear, shame, rejection, unforgiveness, intimidation, anxiety, and lack of self-worth. It is impossible to just go spend time with more people. And when we do spend time with more people, we've got our guard up. So we hide. We tell ourselves relationships are too painful, our wounds are too deep, and if people really get to know me, they're going to reject me. So we hide. You know, some people live in extreme isolation, and we hear some of these instances of people being locked and shut into their house for years and end, but most of us live very ordinary lives. We go to work, we go to church on Sunday, we might even go to life group, but we're still hiding. Well, church, I've got some good news for you today. My father in heaven is an expert at hide-and-go-seek. <laughs> and he's coming to find you today. And we don't have to be afraid because he isn't mad at you. He isn't wanting to punish you. He already knows all the things that you're trying to hide anyway. So whether you're hiding from God or hiding from community, there's hope for you today. The Bible says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us before we sin. He loves us while we're in the midst of sin and he loves us after we sin. Yes, sin breaks his heart and it hurts people. But do you know what makes it worse? Hiding. You know, after that car incident with my wife, she said to me, honey, why didn't you just tell me right away? I want to know that you can trust me and that I can trust you. Ouch. But she was right. And you know what? Katie, in that moment, demonstrated the love of God by the way she responded. She was gracious and forgiving, and she didn't rub it in my face. So what is community? Community. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of community is this, a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. When it comes to Christian community, our common characteristic and interest is this, the sacrificial love of God demonstrated to us through Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I want to live in a community with people that love like Jesus. Jesus himself demonstrates what community might look like. He called his followers his friends and treated them as such. He shared with them everything from meals to his deepest secrets. He served them and cared for them and encouraged them, believed in them when they didn't even believe in themselves. And Jesus wept for his friend when his friend died. But not only this, Jesus let other people share with him too. He let others serve him. He let others care for him. He let others encourage him. He was a safe place for others to come to him with their questions or secrets. He initiated with people who needed friends. And when he was most lonely, he asked people to be with him. Then, as if it weren't enough, he gave the ultimate gift of community by giving his very life up for the people that he loved. By dying on the cross for our sins, Jesus demonstrated the kind of love that God intended for community. The kind of love that says, it's not just about me, it's about us. 
The early church caught on to this type of community which we read about in the book of Acts. But one of my favorite examples from Christian community comes from Paul in his letter to the church of Thessalonica. Paul says this about his spiritual community. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because there are people who merely play church, they show up, and then there are people who actually become the church. Paul's not playing here. The gospel, you see, is not just another religious idea. It's not just another abstract theological concept. The gospel is good news that we are not alone. God is real. He came for us and he loves us. We no longer have to live lives separated from God and separated from community. Because Jesus gave his life for us, we too can now live lives given to others. This is Christian community, the place where I end and we begin. Paul continues in verse 17, I love this. But brothers and sisters, he calls people brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned, by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Paul says, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes again? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. The word glory stood out to me because it almost seems heretical when I first read it. We usually use that word for God, talking about God deserving the glory and honor, and which he does. But Paul is using the word in the Greek, doxa, which definitely translates to glory. Church, let it be said about me that you are my glory and my joy. You are my hope and the crown that I wish to receive when I stand before Jesus. Not my degrees, not my savings account, not my businesses, not the litany of places that I have traveled or adventures I've been on, not my social media following. None of it matters if in the end I don't get to spend eternity with you. What is your glory? What is your joy? What is the thing that you are living for and willing to lay down your life for? And let me ask you this. Does it involve people? Will you weep like Jesus? And will you weep like Paul when your friends leave? Or when it's time for you to leave, will you be able to say that you didn't just go do church, but that you shared your very life with the people around you? This past week, our staff traveled down to Waco, Texas uh, for the U.S. Conference of Churches within our movement. And Katie and I had the opportunity to see a dear friend of ours for the first time in five years. And unexpectedly, we saw each other from across the room during one of the sessions of worship. And Katie said, hey, let's go over and and see her and, and pray with her. So we made our way across the room. And I don't think that any of us had a clue how much we meant to each other truly until we embraced in that moment. Because as we hugged, we came undone. We wept we cried, and all these memories started flooding back of the times that she and her husband opened up their house to us and their lives to us, and they loved us, and they supported us, they prayed for us, and they let us care for them. We walked in life through discernment and disappointment and eventually our departures. Their life was a gift to us, which inspired us to want to give it away to other people. Our very tears were proof of our love. When's the last time You cried because of how much you love somebody. This is Christian community. It's the place where I end and we begin. In preparing for this message, I felt the Lord highlighting some specific groups of people, and I believe that God has some specific words for each group. So starting off, for those of you who don't feel like you have community, I feel like the Lord is saying to you that you belong here. Welcome home. For those of you who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, I believe that God is saying to you today, 
that he wants to be your friend. For the casual church attender, I believe the Lord is saying it's time to open up your heart and take a step deeper into community. For the temporary resident, might be military, students, or people doing internships, I feel the Lord saying this, invest quickly and invest deeply. A lot can happen in a short period of time. My wife Katie and I have been here less than a year and I am blown away by the community that God has brought to us here in this place. For the people who feel that they are too busy, especially families with kids, I believe it's time for you to move from independence to interdependence. Practice sharing your needs with people and then be busy together. For the ones who have felt hurt by someone in community, I believe that God is saying to you today, he is going to give you the grace to forgive those people today. It's time to move on and it's okay to trust again. For the refugees in our midst, I believe that God is saying to you that your gift of hospitality does not require a house. Your very life is to be a spiritual community for many. So let people in. And for those who have been raised in this house, this, this church, maybe you're the graduates of our schools, products of discipleship and life groups, I believe that God is calling many here today to graduate from being sons and daughters of this house to fathers and mothers of this house. And I'll explain the difference. I believe that sons and daughters expect community to foster them, to raise them, to teach them, to nurture them, which is good. But fathers and mothers are the ones who create community by sharing their lives with others. And so it's time to initiate and reciprocate with other people. Stop waiting to be pursued and start pursuing people. At All People's Church, our hope is that you would get rocked, get real, and give it away. The key for us as a community to moving from getting rocked to the point where we're giving it away and changing the world is that you would get real with one another. And the way that we primarily get real with one another around here is in the context of life groups. Life groups are simply this. They're groups of people sharing life with one another. We typically have a meal, we worship together, read God's word and take time to pray for one another. But ultimately, you know what happens? We become friends. I want to invite each of you to connect with a local life group if you haven't already. There's a list of current life groups in the back of your seat. Find one in your area or in your stage of life and reach out to that life group leader. They would love to meet with you, to hear your story and to hear what God is putting on your heart. So at this time, I'm gonna invite the, the band to come up. You guys can go ahead and stand with me here. I wanna give people an opportunity to respond to this. I know that there have been things being stirred in your heart. I'm gonna invite our prayer team and our life group leaders up to the front. And I wanna say this, if you've been feeling isolated, you're feeling alone, longing for friendship, frustrated by friendship, frustrated by people or hiding something that you just need to get off your chest. Or if you haven't yet initiated a relationship with Jesus and you don't know this God of love, God of community, I wanna give you an opportunity to do so today. The people in the front here are our friends. They would love to pray with you. They'd love to hear your story. So in a moment, I'm gonna invite you to come forward. And for the rest of us, as the band plays, let's worship together this God who loves community and who loves us with his life. Let's thank God for being the one who made us for community, even when our default is to run from community. Let's worship this God who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us so that we didn't have to get it all right first before we got to be with God. Jesus said, I'll come to you. And he wants to come and meet you here today. He wants to meet with you here today. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the people in this room, Lord, that I call my friends. I call my community, Lord. They are my joy. They are my glory. They are the, the crown that I wish to wear when I stand before you in heaven saying, 
this was a good investment. These ones were worth your life and your blood on the cross. Father, I pray that we as a church, Lord, would be transformed more into the image and likeness of Jesus so that we might be able to do community all the more. Pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. I will.